All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to start in two minutes. And uh, for those of you that um, uh, came in uh, real close to 8.30, let's try to be here at 8.25, okay? For most of you, thank you. And the second point, just to remind you that all of these speeches will be available uh, via webcast still. And they will be able to have those by, by what day? Um, yesterday. You, you should have them by Tuesday, is that okay? So by Tuesday of next week, you'll be able to access any of these uh, uh, via webcast. And uh, Dr. Ebling is so riveting that PowerPoint would not do him justice. So you won't have PowerPoints for Dr. Ebling's presentation, but uh, uh, that is why you'll, you'll have the webcast. And make certain that uh, as you, you look at the, this particular presentation, you're in for a real treat if you haven't had Dr. Ebling uh, as a professor. And just make certain like you did last night. I was very proud of you. You asked a lot of great questions. And, uh, Make certain that uh, as you go through the, the process today, uh, a pivotal part of this is questions during the Q&A session, or Dr. Ebling will be here for the next couple of days, so you can ask Richard questions uh, in the hallway, et cetera. Somebody asked the question regarding laptops. Right now, my answer with laptops would be, I have no issue with you using laptops, but just respect the uh, speaker's wishes. If it gets too loud, you know, sometimes when everybody has a laptop, it can be problematic problematic. Uh, today the keyboards are such that they're, they're pretty quiet. So I'd say if you want to use a laptop, go right ahead and, and if there's a problem with them, we'll address that uh, at that particular point. Okay? All right. Now, it is my honor to introduce a dear friend, a colleague, and literally, ladies and gentlemen, one of the finest economists uh, in the United States uh, and, quite frankly, the world. He is probably the foremost expert on the great Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, and uh, is also one of the great authorities on the Nobel laureate Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, Richard Ebling was born in New York City. He has uh, an undergraduate degree in economics from uh, Cal State University. He has a master's degree in economics from Rutgers University, and has a doctorate in economics from Middlesex University in England. Uh, he is the author of numerous books, and scholarly articles. He is also uh, published in the popular press across the United States and literally around the world. He is a frequent guest on uh, uh, radio and television across the United States. And uh, Dr. Ebling and I just finished a three-part series on inflation and the national debt for NBC, uh, which has uh, literally gone viral uh, across uh, the United States, MSNBC, CNBC has picked up snippets from it. Um, we were featured in Salon.com, which is a very left-of-center blog, and they um, called Northwood University an academic titan. They were being facetious, but we felt, hey, you, you make it, uh, no, uh, you know, any press is good press in that regard. But uh, what is interesting is that uh, those pieces were, uh, were covered by and carried by and endorsed by David Camp, the head of the House Ways and Means Committee for the U.S. Congress, and just recently, uh, Dr. Ebling testified before Congressman Ron Paul's committee in Washington, D.C. on U.S. monetary policy. Uh, Dr. Ebling this morning will be speaking on the freedom philosophy and economic progress. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome my friend and colleague and your professor, Dr. Richard Ebling. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, not too long ago, a busload of politicians were traveling around the countryside in the American Midwest, and they got themselves on a country road uh, at night. The driver got out of control, careened off the highway into the ditch. Now, about two days later, the local sheriff was going along the country roads trying to figure out what happened to this load of politicians. And finally, he came across the, the, the bus, had it fallen over on its side. It was on the side of the road in the ditch, but there was nobody in the bus. 
So he noticed that there was a nearby farmhouse. And he went up to the door and knocked, and the farmer comes to the door, and the sheriff says, uh, I see that bus. That, that, that's the bus that's been missing for a couple of days. It, it was full with a group of politicians out campaigning. Well, where are they? And the farmer said, well, to be honest, I, I buried them in the back. And the sheriff said, you, you mean they were all dead? And he said, well, as I was covering them over, some of them said no, but you know how those politicians lie. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, next year is going to be a, an election year. You know, you just have to throw this stuff in. Well, it's a pleasure to ha be here, and I'm so glad to see so many of you here. Um, this is my second year doing the Freedom Seminar for Northwood University. Uh, I'm just completing my second year here at, uh, at the university. But uh, it is now decades that uh, Northwood has put on this annual program uh, for students and others. It, in a sense, gives an opportunity to have an encapsulated conception and understanding of what much of what Northwood's uh, philosophy in economics and politics, uh, in history, uh, uh, stands for and represents. And that is sort of the focus of what I'm supposed to spend time with you uh, discussing uh, this, this morning. Uh, in a sense, an encapsulation of the freedom philosophy, uh, the nature of a free society, and the role of government in such a uh, f society of free individuals. Now, since I didn't get too much of a laugh, I'll try one more. Uh, one day, um, a conservative uh, hobbles in in a wheelchair, uh, excuse me, rolls himself in, in a wheelchair into a bar. And he uh, uh, goes up to one of the tables and he sits down, he's there at the table. The bartender comes up to him and says to the conservative, what would you like? And the conservative says, well, I think I would like a glass of wine. So he goes off and he comes back with a glass of wine and he hands it to the conservative in the wheelchair and the conservative looks over in the corner of the room and says, isn't that Jesus Christ in the corner there? And the bar bartender says, yes, that is Jesus Christ in the corner. And the conservative says, well, would you send a glass of wine over to Jesus and tell him it's on me? And then a little uh, later on, uh, a libertarian comes into the bar and he's with a cane and he's hunched over. He has a twisted spine, a hunched back. He's carefully hobbling over to uh, a table and he sits down and the bartender comes up to the libertarian and says, what would you like to have? And the libertarian says, well, you know, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like a liqueur, a, a cognac. And so the bartender comes back with the cognac and the libertarian says to the bartender, um, over there in the corner, isn't that Jesus Christ? And the bartender says, yes, that is Jesus. Well, would you send him over a cognac for me? And a little while later, a liberal Democrat comes in on crutches into the bar. And he hobbles over on his crutches and sits down at a table. The bartender comes over and says, what would you like? And the liberal Democrat says, well, you know, I think I'll have a glass of beer. And the bartender comes back with the beer. And the liberal Democrat looks over in the corner and says, isn't, isn't that Jesus Christ? The bartender says, yes, that is Jesus. Well, would you send him over a, a glass of beer on me? Tell him it's on me. Well, after a little while, Jesus gets up, and he's going to leave the bar, and he goes up to the conservative, and he says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness and generosity, I touch you and I heal you. And whatever the ailment was, uh, paralysis that the conservative was suffering from that was keeping him in the wheelchair, he's now healed. And he comes out of the wheelchair and he's jumping for joy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then Jesus goes over to the libertarian, twisted spine, hunchback, and Jesus touches him and says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness, I heal you. And suddenly the hump on his back is gone and his spine is straightened. And the libertarian He's jumping for joy. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And then Jesus goes over to the liberal Democrat who came in on the crutches. And 
Jesus says, for your kindness and thoughtfulness, and just as about, Jesus is about to touch him, the liberal Democrat says, don't touch me, I'm on government disability. <laughs> See, that got a better laugh. See, I had to do that to get a better laugh. Okay. Now, it's an interesting question. How shall I begin? Well, I want to begin perhaps in the following way. <clears throat> in uh, the first half of the 20th century, there was a French philosopher, uh, excuse me, an Italian philosopher and historian. And his name was Benedetto Croce, C-R-O-C-H-E. And uh, in the 1930s, he wrote a book called uh, History as the Story of Liberty. History as the Story of Liberty. And the theme of this book and several of his others uh, was the idea that if you looked at the history of man throughout recor recorded history and tried to look for themes, a, 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 a common thread running through it all, he was suggesting that one way of organizing, classifying, interpreting the entire stream of human history through the ages was that history was the story of liberty. Because what Benedetto Croce was trying to argue is that for all of recorded history, the battle lines that has occurred uh, through, through the ages has been this distinction between the freedom of the individual and the power of the state and tyranny. If you read the ancient Greeks, particularly the Athenians, you find that in their works, there's this common idea that man is to be free, that individuals are distinct, are unique, should be treated with a certain degree of dignity and respect, and that they should have the freedom, the latitude, the discretion to have a degree of control and autonomy over their lives and, act and their activities as human beings. The contrast, even already in ancient Greece with that, was the neighboring city-state of Sparta. If one wanted to classify it, we would have to say that Sparta was the example of the totalitarian state. Whereas in ancient Greece, individuals had a certain degree of autonomy, of self-expression, uh, self-determination, uh, uh, a degree of, of decision-making over their own lives, and also, at least for the free citizens of Greece, uh, alas, most of the uh, residents of these city-states, including Athens, were slaves. But among the free citizens of, of, uh, of Athens, uh, individuals had a right of political participation. They would meet in a public forum. They would debate the issues and controversies and problems of their community. And they would vote. They would vote. And the majority, just as is, pr is presumed today in a democracy, would determine the election uh, of uh, various dignitaries in the city government and would then institute the policies that the people had deliberated about and voted on. And this contrasted with the, with the neighboring city-state of Sparta. Sparta had no democracy. Sparta had no notion of the autonomy, the dignity, or the respect of the individual. On the contrary, in Sparta, it was believed that the city-state was the be-all and the end-all as an entity in itself. Whereas in Athens, it was believed that each individual had a uniqueness and a special character and quality that made him different from other men and that should be cherished and respected. In neighboring Sparta, the conception was individuals are born, they live their lives, and they pass away. But the city-state lives forever. And as a result, the city-state takes precedence, importance, superior relevance, over anything that may relate to the actions of the individual. In Sparta, the individual was born into a, a city-state in which he was early taken away from his family. He would be educated by the state. He would be given training in an assigned task of responsibility, whether it be as a craftsman, a common workman, whether it be trained to be a warrior, and all citizens of Sparta were required to go through military training. Military training that w was guided by the idea that the primary duty of the individual was not to live for himself, but to live for and be guided by and, if necessary, be sacrificed in terms of his, 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 his life of serving the ends of the city-state. 
In Sparta, there was not democracy, but dictatorship. There was a ruling elite of those who were born into a certain class or caste, and they determined the fate and the position and the status of everyone in the society. In a nutshell, and in a capsulization, Sparta represented the controlled and planned society of the ancient world. Now, for someone like Benedetto Croce, this sort of captured the distinction and the conflicts that have been occurring for all of recorded history. Should man live as an individual, distinct, unique, respected, having a degree of autonomy over his own life? Or should he be viewed as a cog in the machine, as an element to be used and then cast aside if it was no longer useful or did no longer serve the interests of the state? And that encapsulization that Croce saw from the beginning of recorded history of the ancient Greeks is the unending story and pattern and classificatory distinction that we can see running through all of human history. Is the individual the primary <clears throat> and is the state subsidiary? Or is the state primary and the individual is subsidiary? Now in the history of the West, that is Western civilization, this battle has ended up in a constant back and forth, but through the ages always rising to the surface the idea and the principle and the concept that the individual takes precedence over the community and the state. It doesn't mean that the individual does not understand that he is a part of a community or that he does not have obligations and responsibilities to his fellow human beings as part of a society, but that the individual is not to be viewed as a sacrificial animal to be thrown on the fire to serve the interests of a collective merely because they have deemed him unworthy to live for himself. <clears throat> Another way of saying this is that the great conflict between uh, different conceptions of society through the ages has been individualism versus collectivism. The philosophy of individualism says society does not exist independent of the individuals out of, out of which it is a part that society should be considered a composite, an integrative outcome of the interactions and relationships and associations of the individuals of that society. There is no society in the philosophy of individualism separate from the individuals that make it up. It is individuals who think. It is individuals who choose. It is individuals who act. It is individuals who decide to interact with others and do so for various purposes, reasons, causes, and goals. And that, in fact, there is no meaning to society and the social order independent of and unless derived from an understanding and appreciation and a focus upon the uniqueness of the individual as a rational, thinking, choosing, deciding agent. The collectivist philosophy takes the opposite view. In the collectivist philosophy, the group has primary and the individual has secondary importance. As I said in that conception of Sparta, the idea is, is that somehow the collective has an existence and a, a quality, a character of its own. It has a will of its own, a purpose of its own, a deciding element of its own to which the individuals are required to adjust modify and conform their behavior to fit within the purpose of the collective. Now the significance of this distinction, let me suggest, is that if one starts with the individual, then when asked the question, what is the character, the nature, the qualities of the individual? And how out of those qualities, characteristics, and nature do we see him becoming what he is and then interacting with, each o with others to generate a community of self-motivating and self-acting individuals to create a societal structure. If one starts with the collective, one says, what is it that the collective has in common quality or characteristics? And the individual merely becomes a reflection of what is presumed to be true for the collective as a whole. In the individualist philosophy, the individual is viewed as free. In the collectivist philosophy, the individual is viewed 
as something that is required to be obedient, subservient, and enslaved to what is deemed to be the purposes, goals, and benefit of the collective whole. Now this has been the battle through the ages. It has taken various forms. In the most ancient form, it was slavery. It is presumed that there are masters and there are slaves, and that the individuals who are the slaves are to sacrifice themselves for their masters and the community in which the masters live. In a slave society, the individual has no will, purpose, or discretion of his own. He is, as I sometimes express it in class, merely like an implement in a person's hand. You can imagine if you were working in a workshop, you pick up the screwdriver, you pick up the hammer, you pick up the saw, you pick up the drill, you use it and then you just set it aside. It is merely an extension of your hand. But the tool, the implement, has no will of its own, no purpose of its own, no distinct existence of its own, independent of the purposes it serves for the guiding hand that uses it. Under slavery, that is how the slave is viewed. He has no will of his own. He has no purpose of his own. He has no existence of his own. He is merely the extension of the hand that directs him to do the work that the hand wants him to do. In the slave society, if the slave is taken care of by the master, it is not because the slave has a dignity, a distinct quality, a degree of, of deserved respect. No. If the slave master takes care of the slave, if he feeds the slave, if he houses the slave, if he gives medical care to the slave, if he puts clothes on the slave, it is not because he cares about the slave as, a, as an individual himself, but merely with a concern to maintaining the quality features and characteristics that make the slave useful to serve the purposes of the master. If you own a car, do you not occasionally change the oil? Do you not occasionally take it in for a tune-up and change the spark plugs? Do you not make sure that the brakes are working properly or rotate the tires? Of course you do. And why do you do so? Is it because you care about the car as if it was a living separate entity? No. You take care of your car because it is a tool for you to use. And if you do not maintain and take care of it, its qualities, features, and characteristics that make it useful as a means of transportation can deteriorate to the point in which it no longer works properly and can no longer serve, it, serve the purposes for which you want an automobile to get effectively and efficiently and comfortably from point A to point B. If you live in a house, if you own a house and there's a hole in the roof, do you repair the hole in the roof? Yes. Is it because the house is, is an entity for itself that you respect and care about? No. Your house is a means to your end. It is an object that serves your purposes. And if a hole emerges in the roof of the house, and if it's not repaired, it can get worse, and the water can leak in. And if the water leaks in, it will damage your, your property in your house. So you repair the roof, not because the house has an existence of its own, but because you wish to maintain it to serve your purposes. In a slave society in which some claim to be the masters, the rulers, the lords over others, to the extent that the slaves are cared for, it is not because they have a dignity and a respect and an autonomy and a distinction as individuals themselves, but because the slave master realizes that just as giving your car a tune-up or changing the oil or repairing the roof on the house, if you don't feed the slave, if you don't close the slave, if you don't put a roof over the head slave, if you don't give him medical attention when he becomes ill, he will deteriorate in quality, features, and characteristics that enable you to use the slave in the field to serve your purposes. Here, some are viewed as the workers for others. They are viewed as the tools, the implements to other people's purposes. They are the means to other people's ends. They have no ends in themselves. Throughout history, individuals have been expected to sacrifice, to be viewed as sacrificial elements and tools and implements, to serve the interests of others who have declared that they have a right to rule, to control, to dominate, and have attempted to indoctrinate the other members of the society that they, it is their duty to be sacrificial animals for some higher good. 
at least in the oldest form of slavery, there was an honesty in it. Honesty in the sense that one group conquered another group in a war. And those that they did not kill, they enslaved. And they said, you are the booty from our victory. To the victor goes the spoils. And those of you who we have not chosen to kill, we now declare you our slaves. And we are putting you to work to save us the efforts and energies that the work would directly require from ourselves if we did not have you doing it for us. There was an honesty in that. You're my slave, I'm the master, you do as I tell you, or I will threaten physical harm, and if necessary, do physical harm, to get you to obey. And if you refuse to obey, then you have no purpose for me, so I might as well kill you so I don't have to feed a reluctant worker. There was an honesty in that slavery. It was straightforward. But through most of human history, there's been a different attitude and approach. This different attitude and approach has been the rationalization, the philosophical justification, the attempt to argue that individuals must not work for themselves, should not be presumed to have means and purposes and goals for themselves. Individuals should not view themselves as ends in themselves, but are meant to be sacrificial elements, sacrificial animals in their work, in their effort, in their lives to serve some higher common good. The most stark forms of this have emerged in the last 200 years, 250 years with the modern versions of this theme of collectivism. Most, or not, if, not, if not all of them, emerged out of the French Revolution of the late 18th century and has continued since then. Out of the French Revolution came two modern forms of collectivism, nationalism and socialism. How did they emerge out of this? Well, you see, before the French Revolution, most of Europe was ruled by monarchs. And monarchs were people who took the presumption that they and their ancestors had conquered a land. And in the process of conquering the land, they had then allocated this land to their lieutenants in the conquest. These became the lords of the manor, the aristocracy. And the king sat at the head of the process. And the, law, and, the, and the king, as the lord of all of his lands, ruled on what basis? Well, it was difficult to claim that it was on the basis of conquest alone. I conquered you. I own your land. I own your livestock. I own your resources. I own you. And if you, I do not require you to obey me directly, it's because I've apportioned my conquered lands and you among my lieutenants in the conquest. And they are the lords of the manor, the aristocracy, the noblemen, and their descendants. So it emerged before that was the idea of a divine right of kings. He has a right to be an absolute ruler over you. Because God has ordained it. God wants order and stability in society. And if left to the men's own devices, there would be anarchy, there would be chaos, there would be instability, there would be violence. And therefore, for the good of humanity, God has made kings to rule over you, to assure stability, order, tranquility, peace. And God has ordained that to assure those things, you must obey me absolutely, and those to whom I delegate authority in my name. To speak against the king, cut off his tongue, cut out his tongue. As an example to others to terrify them, that others should not listen to what he has to say, cut off his ears. By the way, that was quite common as a punishment for in some way insulting or offending or challenging the king or the aristocracy, the nobleman. To set an example of the individual for having said something 
insulting or offensive to the nobleman or the king to cut out his tongue or to cut off his ears. Or so others can see the punishment to cut off his nose. As a horrifying and deformed example to others to not challenge the authority that the king claimed claim came from a higher authority overall. So kings ruled. And through mo virtually all of the world, everywhere, not just in Europe, there were kings. And while the philosophies were slightly different, all of them claimed to do so based upon a divine giving of power and authority in its absolute form from God in the heavens. Not only in Europe, but in Asia. The Chinese emperors ruled on the same basis, that their, their authority was given to them as a divine power from the gods in heaven. And that is how kings ruled. But in the 16 and 1700s, there began to be a change. Ideas that had emerged and had continued from that time of the ancient Greeks in Athens began to take a more concrete and political form. It was encapsulated in some ways by the English philosopher John Locke, who in the 1600s wrote a treatise, two treatises on government, and in which he turned on its head the notion of the divine right of kings. He began by arguing that individuals have rights. That individuals have a right to their life and their liberty and their property. And that these rights to life, liberty, and property are given to each man by God. God breathes life into the human being. And as part of that life giving, God gives each individual a right to his life, his liberty, and his property. And no one may take away that right to your life. No one may take away your right to your personal liberty. No one may take away the property you have honestly acquired, either through your own labor or through trade with another, other than God himself. And if kings exist, they do not rule absolutely through some divine power. They may have a right to rule, and they may justify it as an authority by the accident of birth as given to them and their families from God, but their rule is not absolute. Their purpose is not to be master but servant. Their purpose as the king is to give order and peace and tranquility to the society, but not through absolute power, but by use of force to protect the rights of the individual against plundering and murder and instability and disorder. The king can only justify his right to rule. Indeed, any government, regardless of its form and type, can claim its right to rule only through and to the extent that it successfully protects the rights of individuals to their life, liberty, and property. How do you acquire property? Well, in Locke's famous example in his treatises on government, he says that a man mixes his labor with the soil. His image is of a man who goes out and settles a previously un unoccupied and unsettled piece of land. He clears the field. He lays the farrows. He plants the seeds. He tends the crop. It comes to be the harvest time in the autumn. He harvests that which his labor has produced. Does not every human being recognize, understand within himself that by a natural right, that which his labor has produced, his mental and physical labor has produced, is rightly his? Would we not all be offended, shocked, considered that a great injustice and immorality had occurred if now bandits and thieves were to come down from surrounding mountains and hills and plunder him of that which his own mental and physical labor had worked diligently to produce 
and leave him nothing, or maybe even kill him in the process of stealing from him. Would we not all be shocked and offended by this? Would we not all consider a great injustice had occurred? Do we not all feel when we look within ourselves that that which is the product of our own mental and physical labor is rightly ours? To be taken, stolen, plundered by no one? So Locke argues that that is the origin of the basis of property. This conception that a man makes something his own when he mixes his mental imagination of what he'd like to produce with his physical effort to actually do the producing with the resources and raw materials in the, society, in the situation he finds himself in that have not been claimed by another. Now you might say, and Locke understands this, well, what if all of the land and the resources have previously been occupied, marked out, established as the private property of others? How does one live then? And Locke has an answer for that. Because there is one inherent private property that each and every one of us possesses, which may not be touched. It is the most intimate and profound and essential private property, yourself. You own yourself. This is your property your mind, your physical existence, and the right to use your mind and yourself in ways that you choose as long as it does not violate the equal and peaceful rights of others to be guided and be free to use their mind and their body as they choose. Is this not the most essential private property? Yourself? Do you like to be touched without your, uh, uh, without your permission? Do we not often all feel uncomfortable when someone gets closer than we want them to get to us physically? Do we not all feel a sense of there's a certain space around ourselves? Why are we not most shocked, and indeed we should be most shocked, with all forms of rape? What is the more, most intimate invasion and aggression and violation of you as a person than the act of rape. This is your body. You own it. Who, what, who is another? On what basis does another violate you in that way? And Locke argues that this makes your very person your most personal property. And that remains your means of earning a living. I'm a professor at Northwood University. I don't own land on which crops can be grown. I don't own factories out of which many of the products that I would like to acquire can be manufactured. I don't, I don't own research, lab, research laboratories where innovations and improvements and technological knowledge can be advanced so that more and better and improved products that I'd like to buy can be designed and prepared for the manufacturing process. I don't own any of this. I only own myself. And so what do I do? I use my mind and myself to earn a living. How do I do so? I sell my labor services to Northwood University. I sell them through the university to you. You're my customer. It may not always seem that the professor is the, that you're the customer and the professor is, 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 is the, uh, the seller when it comes to exam time. Seems like he's telling you what you have to do. But the fact is you are the customer. It's your demand and desire for an education. Your wish to learn certain things in classroom settings that results in a market supply of that which you want to purchase. And an institution such as Northwood University, to be able to provide that service, service hires individuals such as myself, or Dr. Nash. And we then go into the classroom and give you a product, our knowledge 
in this case as economists. And given the market estimation and value of my labor services in supplying you that type of knowledge, Northwood University pays me a salary. And with the income that I have earned by selling my mental labor, I then to go out, go out in the marketplace and proceed to buy all the other things that I desire that others have the resource ownership over and the manufacturing capability to provide to produce all of those finished goods that I then go into the marketplace to acquire. So therefore, if I cannot settle an unclaimed and uns, uh, 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 unsettled uh, land, then I can still acquire what others are producing through the act of exchange by the selling of that property that can never be alienated from me, and that is my mental ability to do things. Now Locke argues, Locke argues that this makes the essence of what a free society, a stable society, an ordered society, should be viewed as all about. It is a society of individuals, each of whom have these rights to his life and his liberty and his property. And that what then is the role of government? The government is not to be the master, the controller, the manipulator, the dominator. It is to be the servant to see that your rights are protected. So if the king can justify his rule, however much he may say that God through the accident of the lineages of birth have appointed him in this role. He must only justify what he does in the name of securing his subjects' rights to their life and their liberty and their property. And if he violates them, if he abuses them, if he fails in this assigned duty, then in principle the people have a right to abolish that monarch, that government, and to create another. Now this philosophy in John Locke, written originally in the 1620s, became the basis of the American Revolution. It is the heart of that most famous passage that we've all learned in school from the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that government is instituted among men to secure these rights. And the Founding Fathers go on to say, and that when government fails in this, or indeed ends up abusing people's rights rather than protecting them, the citizens of that society have a right to overthrow that government and to establish a new government that will in fact give them that security and protection and tranquility that the previous government failed to provide. If one reads the rest of the Declaration of Independence, it's not a long document. We all know those famous words that I just was repeating, but the rest of the document, about 90% of the rest of the document, which most of us don't really remember, is in fact the enumeration of the grievances against the King of England, King George III, and his Parliament. And what are these enumerated grievances? That the government is violating the rights of the individual. They regulate, they control, they manipulate, they restrict, they prevent they unjustifiably tax. In other words, what the Founding Fathers were saying is that if it is presumed that individuals have these individual rights of the form that John Locke had expressed and clarified about 150 years earlier, then by that standard and benchmark of the justification of government, 
the British government has failed. We have attempted to petition the government and the king. We have attempted to gain redress for our grievances. We are not a, a resorting to revolution to overthrow the government as the first resort, but as the last resort. We have tried every means at our disposal for reasoning, petitioning, peaceful argumentation to have this government that claims the right to rule over us to stop violating those basic natural rights rather than violating them. To protect them. And now we have concluded that that is impossible. That there seems to be no way to get the government to admit the errors of its ways and to protect our liberty rather than violating our liberty. And therefore we take that extreme and final resort and we declare our independence even though it means us taking on as 13 small colonies on the eastern seaboard of the North American continent with a population total of the 13 colonies of only 3 million at that time to take on the entire might and power of the British Empire. Locke's ideas and the Founding Fathers' formulation and of it and justification of their American Revolution on the basis of it was a crowning achievement of this train of ideas that had its origin in places such as ancient Athens and the idea that the people are sovereign, not the king. That they have a right of self-rule, not the king. That they are the masters, and anyone who holds a political position is the servant. Self-rule. Now when the Founding Fathers spoke about self-rule, when this was articulated in the Declaration, and formulated in the, the Constitution, of the specification of the different branches of government and their enumerated functions. I would like to suggest that if you read the Founding Fathers and understand what they mean by a self-governing and self-ruling people, there are two meanings to this. The first one is the one that we are most familiar with when we think about a representative government or a republic or a democracy. And that is that the people are self-ruling and self-governing because they elect or appoint those who will hold political office for a specific period of time. We, the people, have a right to argue, debate, discuss the issues. We, the people, have a right to either run ourselves for political office or to vote on those who choose to run for political office and through the voting process to appoint them for a specified period of time, two years, four years, six years, depending upon the stipulated institutional uh, period over which someone holds a, a political position before the next election. And that is self-rule, that is self-governing. That's what democracy means in the political sense. But it is very clear from their conception of individual freedom that the Founding Fathers meant something more than merely self-rule and self-government as the election and the appointment of political appointees for a period of time. More fundamental, more essential, more foundational was a other conception of self-rule and self-governing. And that was the Founding Fathers' notion that each individual is self-ruling and self-governing that each individual has a right to control his own life and liberty. It is why when we look at the Constitution, the federal government has a set of very narrow and limited enumerated functions. 90% of what our government does today at the federal level is not in the Constitution if you read specifically 
what are the enumerated functions of the executive branch, the presidency, the legislative branch, the Congress, the judiciary, the Supreme Court. 90% of what our government does today is not in the Constitution. There is nothing in our Constitution that gives the federal government the authority to make you pay and then dole out Social Security for your retirement. There is nothing in the enumerated and limited functions of the federal government to give the government in Washington the power and authority to tax you and then allocate and distribute health care. There is nothing in the federal constitution in its specific and limited enumerated functions for the government to provide public housing, to provide any money for public education. And those of you who may have, have or have had some form of federal loan, grant, or scholarship, there is nothing in the Constitution that the Founding Fathers enumerated as a function for the federal government to do in that avenue. In other words, the federal government is giving you something, or gave you in the past if you had such a loan, grant, or scholarship, that the Founding Fathers did not assign as a function of the federal government. And it's very clear in the, in the state, in the, in the laying out of the Constitution, that these are the functions of the federal government, no more and no less. And if it's not in one of the enumerated functions, it's not the duty or responsibility of the federal government. That is why there is the Ninth and Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. which says merely because we've enumerated for clarification and specification some of the rights of the individual that government may not violate in the earlier eight amendments to the Constitution, our Bill of Rights, government may pass no law abridging freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, freedom of association. Government pa pa may pass no law abridging your right to the safety and security in your person or property without due process of law. Which means that you cannot be arrested, nor can your home be invaded or searched without justifiable cause with the signing of a warrant by a judge. The government shall pass no law imposing cruel and unusual punishment. The government shall pass no law abridging your right to bear arms. These are among those that are specified in the first eight of the ten original ten amendments of the, of the Constitution, our Bill of Rights. But they make it very clear in the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment that merely because some rights have been enumerated in the first eight amendments to the Constitution does not mean that those are the only rights the people have. And they make it clear that the people have many other individual rights that also may not be abridged in spite of the fact that for clarity they've not been enumerated and specified with emphasis in the earlier eight and they specify in those last two amendments to the Constitution, the last two of the original ten amendments to the Constitution, that those powers not delegated to the federal government, specifically in the words of the Constitution, are reserved to the people and the states respectively. So if it's not in the Constitution, the federal government doesn't have the authority to do it. Which is what I mean by the fact that about 90% of what our federal government does, that government in Washington, D.C., is not unconstitutional if one takes it in a literal understanding of the words of the Constitution. Now, why do I bring this up, having talked about self-government? Because if government is not to provide for your old age, if it's not to provide for your health care, if it's not to provide public housing for a roof over your head, if it's not to provide money for your education, if it's not to provide unemployment insurance, if it's not to provide this, that, and the other, 
of a vast array of what we call social welfare and entitlement programs, then who provides it? And the answer is you. That was the philosophy of the founding fathers. What does self-government mean? It's your responsibility to do these things for yourself and your family. Let me explain this in, in a context. In the Old South, before the American Civil War, when say, slavery still prevailed in those southern states, almost every one of those southern states in their constitutions had, a, had a, a, a law that permitted manumission. What the hell is manumission? Well, in the old slave South, the manumission law specified that if a slave master deemed that one of his slaves had done something of extraordinary merit for himself or a family member, he, as the slave owner, had a right under that southern state's constitution to free his slave. In other words, to reward the slave for some meritorious act, he could be given his freedom. Now, what did it mean to be free, to be no longer a slave? As a slave, you were on the slave owner's plantation in the Old South. He gave you three meals a day. He put a roof over your head. It may not have been a great roof, but it's a roof over your head. He put clothes on your back. It may have been hand-me-down rags, but you had clothes on you. And if you became ill, the, the slave owner saw that you had medical treatment. It may not, not have been the, of that time, state-of-the-art medical treatment that he gave himself and his own family members, but he gave you medical treatment because if you're sick or injured, you can't be working in the field. Like giving your car a tune-up, you've got to make sure the guy gets over the illness so he can be out working again. In other words, slavery provided the slave with a vast array of what we call welfare state benefits. And now you were free, and guess what? You no longer had them. The slave master has freed you. He's not responsible to give you three meals a day, to put clothes on your back, to put a roof over your head, to give you medical treatment if you become sick. Guess whose responsibility it is? Your own. That's what a free individual meant. I now have control over my life. I make decisions. I'm not a means to the slave owner's ends. I'm an end in myself. I make my goals. I decide on my purposes. I give value, meaning, and direction to my life. I'm not a tool anymore in the hand of the slave owner for him to use, abuse, and put aside. A free man was a man who now had responsibility to go out and earn a living to put food on the table for himself and his family, to put a roof over his head over himself and his family, to put clothes on his back and his family members, and to see that he had earned enough that if necessary to pay the expense to a, for, for the visit to a doctor. That is what a free man meant. You are self-ruling and self-governing. You govern yourself. You are your own lord and master. A free man, therefore, a free individual, is one who has the responsibility to take care of these things for himself. And that is why these were not assigned functions in the Constitution by the Founding Fathers. Because to be free meant that you were no longer a slave. And to be free meant you were responsible to take care of these things yourself. That was the philosophy of individualism. That was the philosophy of liberty. That was the philosophy of a society of free men and women who associated and interacted not on the basis of lord and servant, but of equal individuals 
who associate, who interact, who trade, who buy and sell from others that which others have the ability to produce in exchange for that which you yourself can provide to them in trade. That was the essence of a free society. That stood in stark contrast, let me suggest, to the ideas that emerged out of the French Revolution. The American Revolution, I just want to remind you, Declaration of Independence, July of 1776. We fight the British until 1783, right? George Washington, the Revolutionary Army, fighting the Brits. And finally, the British accepted defeat and recognized the independence of the United States, well, the 13 colonies at that time, independent sovereign colonies, in 1783. And we had a, uh, an informal compact called the Articles of Confederation for the next several years between these 13 sovereign states that was then transformed under a new constitution, which is our constitution, that became the law of the land in 1787, the Constitution of the United States, binding those 13 colonies and then together. And then, of course, the growth of those colony, those is that United States until now, it's the size on a map that it is today. Well, two years later came the French Revolution, 1789, also in July. Now, the French Revolution is a story in itself. It went this way and that way, the other way. But the bottom line was, is that at first they attempted to impose a constitution on the King of France. To have sort of like a, quote, constitutional monarchy, as was a de developing in Great, Great Britain, and had developed in Great Britain. But the bottom line was that by 1790, it became an unworkable solution because neither the king nor the more radical French revolutionaries wanted this. And the upshot was the king attempted to flee Paris. He was brought back when it was discovered that he was attempting to escape. He was brought back to Paris and before a tribunal, he and the queen and his mistress, he had a queen and a mistress, uh, sort of, I guess, like the head of the IMF. Oh, anyway, it's bad, I know. Anyway, so uh, he was finally, uh, they decreed that he would be beheaded. And the king was executed. He was beheaded. Now, already by this time, revolutionary France was fighting wars with its monarchy neighbors. And a French army was in the field in eastern France, fighting an army of Germans and Swedes, who had invaded France to try to restore the monarchy, to overthrow the revolutionary government in Paris. And a rider arrives from, from Paris to the front line. And he informs the French soldiers that the king is dead. He has been found guilty of treason. He has been taken to the scaffold. He's been executed. He's been beheaded. And one of the Fr French officers at this army facing the, the Germans and the Swedes so, but, but if the king is dead, who do we fight for now? And the messenger says, you now fight for the people, the nation. And that is the beginning of modern nationalism. Before the French Revolution, nationalism in the form that we take for granted, oh, it's my country, I own allegiance, you know, love it or leave it, that did not exist before the French Revolution in any modern form. Because kings and princes would conquer surrounding areas, or they would trade territories with other kings and princes for financial reasons, or there would be marriages that would be arranged between the dynasties of monarchies. And through marriages, territories would be combined. And on these territories would be people speaking different languages, having different cultures, different customs and traditions. So it was like a hodgepodge. And all that connected them was the fact that they were ruled by a particular king. But now with the French Revolution and the end of the king, then where does one's allegiance reside then? 
if not to this king, supposedly with divine authority to rule from God. The people rule. And the people are the nation. And therefore your allegiance is to the nation. And that now became the new collectivism. The new collectivism as the 19th century progressed into the 20th century, that now the individual was a cog in the machine of the nation. The nation takes precedence. The nation is paramount. The nation is superior to the individual. And the individual only has existence, identity, meaning, context. Within the nation he belongs. The language he speaks, the customs and traditions that he's grown up in, the folklores that he's learned as a child, the national and ethnic uh, uh, stories and legends that he's, that he's learned in his youth, his identity as the, as, as the descendant of some earlier group of people having these common lineages, this ethnic identity, and finally in the case with German nationalism, race identity. And now the individual is to be sacrificed to the collective nation. You are the language you speak. You are the race to which you belong. You are the nationality and ethnicity into which you have been brought up. That identifies you. That's who you are. You have no existence, no meaning, no sense of orientation, meaning, purpose, or identity, independent of the nation. And you are to sacrifice for the nation. You are to live for the nation. You are to work for the nation. So as the 19th century progressed and entered the 20th century, the idea of the nation state became the ideal to which an individual is to owe allegiance, conform to, and sacrifice for if necessary. The other modern form of collectivism that also arose out of the French Revolution was socialism. Socialism said your, uh, your, your, your allegiance, your sense of identity, your, your, your sense of belonging was not to the nation but to a social class. The working class, the proletariat, and you were either a member of the proletariat or the working class, or you were part of the capitalist ruling class. And the in idea that the individual should be viewed as distinct, independent, autonomous, unique, again was submerged within the idea, not a nation, but within a social class. You have no identity. You have no sense of orientation, meaning, or existence, independent of belonging to a social class the working class or the property-owning capitalist class. And they are at conflict, at war with each other, just as nation-states are at war. And just as you are expected to die for your country, you must die for your social class. And out of that in the 19th century emerged the modern revolutionary socialist and communist ideal and revolutionary cause that reached its, its zenith in the 20th century. Now whether it is socialism, where the identity of an individual is defined by his social class, whether it is nationalism, where your identity is defined by the nation state or the ethnic or racial or linguistic group to which you belong, in either case, you are nothing. You are a droplet in a stream of water. The, the river is real, the droplet of water is nothing. The nation is real, the individual is nothing. The social class is, is real, the individual is nothing. In each of these collectivist philosophies, the presumption is, is that the individual counts for nothing. His is to serve, to sacrifice, to exist for the collective, whether it be nation or social class. Only this American ideal, 
only this American ideal. Out of that beginning ideas of the ancient Cre Greeks, solidified in this philosophy of John Locke in the 1620s, formulated by the Founding Fathers in the Declaration and institutionalized in our Constitution, only this tradition of ideas says that you are not a sacrificial animal. You do not live and exist for the collective. You live and exist for yourself. And whether you believe that your right to your life is given to you by God, whether you believe that your right to your life is given to you by the very nature of what you are, guided by your reason, you are not a sacrificial animal. You have a right to your life, your liberty, and your honestly acquired property. You have a right to live for yourself and not required to live for and sacrifice for others in the form of a collective. That has been the battle throughout history. That is what I would suggest Benedetto Croce was attempting to get at when he talked about history as the story of liberty. The attempt of the individual to free himself from chains. The attempt of the individual to free himself from the dictatorship of monarchs and nation states and social, socialist class conflicts and to have an arena around himself in which he says, I have a right to, li to live. Honestly and peacefully guided by the things that give value, meaning, purpose to my life. As I define them, as I consider them good and right and just, and not as others dictate them and attempt to force them upon me. That is the real meaning of individualism. That the individual has a right to his life. If that's true, how do men live together in such a free society of self-governing and self-ruling individuals? And why is that superior and different from what collectivism would require an individual to live in the context of and under? Well, that's what I want to talk about in the second half of our time this morning. So let me take, let's take a break. We will, uh, for let's say about 15 minutes, we'll come back at about 10 o'clock. I'll finish up my remarks and then we'll have question and answer. Set to go? Okay. Well, welcome back. Okay. Wow. Uh, we have a, uh, another segment to go this morning. And I wanted to build upon and discuss uh, some of the implications of these two conceptions of individualism and collectivism. Uh, and I want to focus more narrowly on the economics of them, if I may. Uh, I said that the American philosophy of individualism uh, is based upon the idea that the individual is self-ruling and self-governing. He makes his own choices and decisions. He picks his own ends and goals. He obviously, therefore, has to decide on the most appropriate means or methods to try to attain those uh, goals or ends. Uh, the state, the political authority, does not have the uh, responsibility, duty, or obligation, uh, or indeed the right, uh, to uh, secure, protect, or paternalistically provide uh, many of those uh, 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 social services, as they're called today, of uh, so social security retirement, or medical care, or education, or housing, or a whole variety of others. 
Now, if this is the case, how do individuals associate? What assures that individuals can achieve the ends and goals that they desire? In other words, if government does not direct, if government doesn't command, if government doesn't provide, if government doesn't guarantee, how do people live? How do they get fed? How do they get the clothes on their back, the shelter over their head, the amenities, convenience, and necessities of everyday life? Well, the advocates of liberty in the 1700s and the 1800s, the 18th and 19th centuries, believe that self-ruling and self-governing men could establish order, in fact, would naturally emerge in a system of order, pattern, uh, integrated harmony through the free choices and decisions of people in the marketplace. The best way to understand this is in the context of that most famous of uh, 18th century, 1700s economists, and that is Adam Smith. Now, I would presume that most of you have taken uh, an economics class, uh, micro, macroeconomics, uh, perhaps you've taken uh, Northwood's course on the philosophy of American enterprise. Some of you might have even taken that course with me. And uh, therefore, a little bit of what I'm going to be saying and putting in context uh, should be readily understood in terms of that uh, earlier course material that perhaps you took. Adam Smith, in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, at one point says that what he advocated and wanted to see established was what he called a system of natural liberty. A system of natural liberty. And he said that under such a system of natural liberty, each individual would be free to live his own life peacefully as he chose and freely compete against any other individual or group of individuals in any profession, occupation, or trade as the means by which he would earn a living by selling whatever it was he was specializing in to other people in the marketplace. And Smith goes on in that passage in The Wealth of Nations to say that under such a system of natural liberty, government would have basically a small, though admittedly essential, set of functions, duties, and responsibilities. He basically sees three functions. The first one, he says, is police and courts. Certainly, people can act in an aggressive and plundering way towards their neighbors. They can attempt to kill their neighbor. They can attempt to uh, steal or rob from their neighbor. They could attempt to defraud or cheat their neighbor. And certainly, it is legitimate, uh, as John Locke had been suggesting, as the legitimate roles and functions of government, that certainly there is the place for police and courts to secure and protect an attempt to uh, prevent such violations of each individual's right to his life, liberty, and property. So the police are there to <clears throat> deter, and if a, such an aggressive act occurs, to attempt to capture that, the person who's accused of being the guilty party and, if possible, uh, regain the property that may have been stolen from another. The courts obviously have a responsibility. Has a crime occurred? If it has occurred, what is the nature of a crime? A, a crime of violence against the person? A crime against someone's property? And if a crime has occurred against a person's person or property, who is the suspected guilty party? And under Ameri British and then American law, the presumption has been innocence until proven guilty. You're innocent. You've been accused of a crime. But the presumption is that you're innocent. And the burden of proof falls upon the, the government court system to demonstrate that there is sufficient suspicion that you are the guilty party, having committed this type of a crime, for you to be held over and bound for trial. And then at the court of law, you have a defense attorney, but he defends you in the context of the government, right, the state attorney, having to demonstrate that a crime has occurred, the crime was committed against this person or that person's property, and that these are the reasons for believing that this person sitting at the other table was the perpetrator of this crime. And the burden falls upon the government to demonstrate it in a court of law before a jury of a selection of members of the citizenry who are vetted to make sure that they have 
uh, a fairly wide degree of uh, dispassion and disinterestedness to just look at the evidence on its own impartial basis and decide whether the accused is actually the guilty party. If he's innocent, <clears throat> he's let go and nothing hangs over his head. If he's guilty, well, then the legal system will have evolved a set of notions of a punishment fitting the crime and that will, may very well be the punishment if the individual is found guilty. And that is meant to both punish the guilty, assure some degree of restitution perhaps to the victim, and to act as a deterrence that there are punishments for crime to perhaps dissuade others from acting in the same way. So certainly there is a legitimate purpose, Smith says, for police and courts. He also believes that there is a place for national defense. Just as there can be domestic bandits and thieves and murderers, there can be international bandits and thieves and murderers. Right? Other nations, governments in other nations, can send armies to invade your country to kill you, to plunder your property, to occupy your lands, to perhaps enslave you, to control you. And just as there's a legitimate purpose for domestic police to prevent robbery and murder, well, it's appropriate for there to be an army and national defense against foreign murderers and thieves. And then Smith has a third category of a small handful of what he considers public services. Smith believed that perhaps there was a role for government to build roads, uh, a canal, uh, a, a lighthouse on the shore uh, to assure that ships perhaps did not wreck on rocks along the coast. But except these and a small other handful of uh, functions other than defense and police and courts, Smith believed that individuals should basically be free and solve their own problems by themselves or in conjunction with others. And how was this to be done, Smith asked? Well, in a nutshell, he said that in the right institutional setting, individuals will assure and establish and spontaneously bring about their own system of order, pattern, integration, and stability. Many of you have heard perhaps this famous phrase of his, the invisible hand. Well, all Adam Smith said is that let us assume that there has evolved in a society a system of individual rights, as was emerging in the Great Britain of his time of the 1700s and uh, would emerge in the United States. In fact, it already emerged in the United States and was the basis of the, coloni the col colonist complaint against the King of England. Let's suppose that there is a emerging a notion of individual rights and that this includes property rights. And let us suppose that this also has emerged a system that people do not have a right to steal from each other or defraud each other or to kill each other. That if they want what another has, the only way that they can acquire it is through peaceful trade and exchange. If you have something I want, then I must persuade you to sell it to me, to exchange it to me, to trade it to me for something that I possess that you're willing to take as uh, in reciprocation. And Smith says that we would imagine, and it's a long story and is part of actually a you know, part of a, my explanation of Smith's ideas in, in a course on the philosophy of American enterprise at Northwood, is that how he believed the institution of division of labor emerges out of people discovering that they have different talents, skills, abilities. And once there is a system of division of labor emerged in a setting of individual liberty, property rights, and a notion of voluntary exchange, that is you cannot steal from people, you must only peacefully persuade them to trade with you, that that sets up a setting, Smith argued, in which individuals in their own self-interest will have to see about serving the, the interests and the circumstances of others in the society. How, Smith says? Well, he says, if I can't rob you and I can't kill you to get what you have that I want, then I must persuade you to sell it to me. How do I persuade you? I must be able to offer you in exchange something that you value more highly than what you possess that I'm asking you to sell to me. Therefore, I have to apply my knowledge, my ability, my expertise, my experience, my productive abilities to find some niche, corner, aspect of a system of division of labor in which I will specialize and make that which I think you and others would be willing to take and trade 
in exchange for what you and others have that I desire. Therefore, Smith argued that in a system of natural liberty, individuals will find that in their own self-interest, they must take into consideration the wants, desires, wishes, and preferences of others in the society. Because unless I can make something that you want and that you value more highly than what I'm asking you to give me in trade, I cannot acquire from you that which I desire. Therefore, each in his own self-interest must take into consideration the improvement of the conditions of others. Therefore, it is through self-interest that the wider common good, that is the interests of all of us as individuals, can be cumulatively enhanced and improved and taken care of in the society. It is not necessary for the government to command. It is not necessary for the government to direct. It is not necessary for the government to control. It is not necessary for the government to regulate and plan. Indeed, Smith says, that each individual in his own corner of the society knows his own circumstances, knows his own abilities, knows his own opportunities, far better than a, a regulator, a planner, a, a, gov a politician sitting in a faraway capital can ever know, appreciate, and understand the way we can understand and appreciate our own local circumstances. Who knows your situation better than yourself? Who can look around and say, I'm be uh, these are my talents, these are my abilities, this is my experience, this is my inclinations and likes and dislikes. This is what I think I'm qualified for, this is what I think I, I could do and which I would like to do, this is the opportunity that seems best given all of my circumstances in terms of what I value and consider important and like to do, and this is the avenue in which I think I can best earn a living for myself and my family. As opposed to the politician, the regulator, the planner in, this, in the capital, presuming to know enough the detail, the specifics, the nuanced aspects of each and every one's lives to plan better for them than they can for themselves. And Smith says that's, that's absurd. And indeed, he goes so far in a famous passage as to say, never is such giving such power to a politician or a regulator or a planner more dangerous than when put into the hands of someone arrogant enough to believe that he knows what is best for others, better than those others themselves. Never is it more dangerous when it is in the hands of a person who has the hubris, the arrogance, the presumption, the pretense that he knows enough about everyone else's circumstances to know what is best for them, better than them themselves. And none of us like to be told what to do. We have friends, we have relatives, we have acquaintances. We sometimes feel comfortable talking to them about our problems, our difficulties, our hesitancies, our doubts, our question marks about what to do in various aspects of our life. And we listen to them. And we try to maybe take what they have to say into consideration. And sometimes we take their advice. But do you like to be forced to take that advice? And do you take the advice of the person who you do not consider intelligent, informed, or knowledgeable enough to appreciate your circumstances as you see them? No. But it is arrogance and hubris and dangerous, Smith says, when there are people who are presumptuous enough to believe that they know enough about everyone's life to plan those people's lives better than themselves and to force others to conform to and fit within with those planners or regulators in a faraway capital insist will be the way that you will live and act and earn a living. And then that ba it is on that basis Smith went on to argue that when men are acting in their own self-interest it is as if by an invisible hand that they serve the interests and the improvements of others even though it is no part of their conscious intention. Think of the fellow who is in Nebraska, for example, who's growing wheat. What the hell does he know about you? He doesn't know you. He's never met you. He never will meet you. He doesn't know a damn thing about you. To be honest, that wheat farmer in Nebraska, he doesn't even know you personally exist. He doesn't know you from Adam. 
But you know what? He is working each and every day on his farm to grow the wheat that will be harvested at, at the appropriate time of the season so it can be taken to the granary and thrashed into a form that will then enable a baker to make a loaf of bread so you can go to the store and have the toast with your breakfast or the sandwich for lunch. Therefore, he is in the process each and every day of his working time on his farm to grow the, the wheat that becomes the bread for your toast or, break, or lunch. Even though it is no part of his... Why is he doing this? Well, his father was a fa farmer. He likes living out in the country. It's what he feels comfortable with. He knows how to, you know, how to grow wheat. And it's a way for him to earn a living, right? So he can sell the wheat for a market price and then proceed to use the income that he's earned to go into the marketplace himself as a consumer and buy all the other things that others in the society have been specializing in, which he as a farmer can't produce for himself. It is not necessary for people to know each other. It is not necessary for people to know all the specifics and details, needs, wants, and desires of every other person with whom they, in this vast array of associ associative exchange, directly, indirectly are connected with. It is sufficient that they see that the serving of others' wants and desires can be the appropriate and useful means to generate the income that enables them to buy the things they want to pursue what they view as in their own personal self-interest. How does the market assure that the people know what you and I want and we'd be willing to pay for and would like for them to do in terms of their specialized skill, ability, or expertise? Well, as a Nobel laureate economist named Friedrich Hayek pointed out a long time ago in a famous article called The Use of Knowledge in Society, and if you have taken that Northwood course, it's mandatory for everyone attending Northwood, uh, on this philosophy of American enterprise in the textbook that is assigned called uh, When We Are Free. There is reprinted in there Hayek's article called The Use of Knowledge in Society. And the theme of that is to explain how this coordination process occurs even in an environment of free men who go their own way without command or control by the government. And what is this mechanism? He explains it's not necessary for, know, for us to know each other, who we are personally, specifically, our unique and personal wants, desires, wishes. It is sufficient that we can all be coordinated through this indirect method of what he refers to as the communication system of market prices. It's not necessary for you to know the Nebraska farmer. It is sufficient that you go into the market and offer a market price for the loaf of bread. And that market price that you're willing to pay for the loaf of bread tells others, the wholesaler who, f who supplies the bread to, 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 the, to, to the supermarket, the, whole, the, 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 uh, the baker who sells the bread to the wholesaler, the flour mill who sells the flour to the baker, and the farmer who sells the harvested wheat to the flour mill. It is sufficient through the price that you're willing to pay for a loaf of bread that this is what you want and the value you place upon it. And it is sufficient that we do that and we express that through each and every other price that we're willing to offer and pay for the goods and services that we desire in the society. And that is a sufficient, reduced form, common, minimal denominator for everyone to communicate what they want, what they desire, the value they place upon it, and what it would cost in terms of hiring resources, raw materials, labor, machinery, equipment, or the use of land to make those goods. It's not necessary for every businessman to know every other businessman who would also like to hire you to do a job or to rent or purchase a piece of land to either grow food for farming or to build a factory upon. It's not necessary for every businessman to know every other businessman in terms of the resources and raw materials that they would like to use in a particular manufacturing process in comparison to his own. 
It is sufficient that each and every businessman evaluates what the consumers want, the prices the consumers might be willing to pay for the finished product that they hypothetically might be able to manufacture and offer for sale, and on the basis of what they think the consumers would be willing to pay to make their best evaluation, judgment, and appraisement as to what resources, raw materials, labor services, land, capital machines would be worth to manufacture the good in question. And then to say, hey, don't sell or rent the land to him. I'll pay you $150 more a month. D don't work for him. Work for me in my production process. I'll pay you an extra 75 cents an hour. Uh, d d don't make a machine for him for his production process. Make some machine that I need for my manufacturing activities. I'll pay an extra $1,500 if you make the machine for me instead. And those prices then act as the guiding judgment of businessmen to compare selling price to the consumers and what it would cost to manufacture the product in terms of purchasing higher renting the resources, raw materials, labor services, and capital equipment to do the production itself. And therefore, the businessman can compare profit and loss, more profit, less profit, combining the resources in this way compared to that way to minimize the monetary expense of bringing the, the production process into existence and the product finally to the consumer who might be willing to pay that price that the businessman hopes for and which will determine whether he makes the profit that he anticipated or the loss that he'll regret. And that itself is the negative feedback to tell him, you know what, I made an entrepreneurial error. This is not what the consumers want. Either the consumers do not value it as much as I thought, or my rivals, my competitors' version is better, more attractive, less expensive than mine, and I better find a way to match the competition or finally offer what the consumers want, or I'm going to have to find a different line of production. That is how everything gets coordinated in the market. The self-interest of each individual, the need to interact on the basis of voluntary exchange, and the network of market prices in a competitive environment that supplies the necessary information for each, and a, each of us to decide what to do, but in a way that ends up coordinating everything that we do with everyone else in the market. That is why we can live in this global economy now. And that's what we do live in. As many have pointed out, it's almost like a joke now, a caricature. You go into the store, and you, you, one product after another. And what do you look at? Ah, made in China. China is on the, literally on the other side of the globe, 10,000 miles away. Do you know any of those people in China? I don't. Do any of those people in China know you? They don't. Yet they are busy in factories in China, manufacturing, producing, preparing to ship and to send over to here the, into the United States a vast array of goods and services that represents the products that we want to buy that have the qualities and features we're looking for at very attractive prices. How do they know what we want? So they can earn a living in those factories in various places in China. It's not necessary for them to know us or communicate with us directly. It is sufficient that there are the global prices of which we are part of the contributors as the buyers of goods and the prices we're willing to pay for them, to inform people on the literally the other side of the world what it is we want, we'd be willing to pay for, and their decision whether it would be profitable or not, given the cost of labor, resources, raw materials, land, and capital equipment in their part of the globe. And they coordinate, integrate, establish in, 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 in pattern everything that they're doing with us. And that integrates the global economy without a planner, without a director, without a regulator, without an overseer, commander, telling each and every individual what to do. Each is free, yet bound with his neighbor. Each is at liberty, but directs his activities in ways that coordinates with and serves the interests and improvements of others. Without command, control, dictatorship, or threat of force or its use. What a brilliant and magnificent system. Order without command. Pattern without imposition. Association without compulsion. That is the miracle, that is the majesty 
That is the, 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 the beauty of this global market order that each of us are now part of, that binds together not hundreds, not thousands, not millions, what connects billions of people into one associative pattern of division of labor that we call the planet market economy. That is the system of liberty. That is the system of liberty, which was in such stark contrast to the attempts of the 20th century to impose systems of economic as well as political collectivism on so much of the world. Those systems of nationalism and socialism reached their hallmark in the 20th century in countries such as the Soviet Union or Nazi Germany. Systems based upon class or national, nationality and race viewed each individual as the cog in the machine in systems of economic planning. You were not free to live your own life. You were not free to direct your own economic activities. You were not free to decide how to earn a living in either Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. The government had planning agencies. In the Soviet Union, they had five-year plans. In Hitler's not Nazi Germany, they had four-year plans. But whose plan? The government's plan, imposed on each and every one in the society, to which each and every one was expected to be confined and required to conform. The government decided what would be produced. The government decided how it would be produced. The government decided who would do the work. The government decided where the work would be done. And the government decided how the output would be distributed among the different members of the society. But as people like Hayek have also argued, besides the tyranny of it, the tyranny of it, it's not you deciding where you'd like to work. It's not you deciding where you'd like to live. It's not you deciding what products you'd like to buy with the qualities, features, and characteristics that you think would be most useful and attractive for your purposes in your life. Besides the tyranny of the government commanding all of these things, confining you within their plan, making you adapt and adjust and be limited to their plan, and the tyranny of that, as Hayek has argued, there was an arrogance, a hubris, a pretense of knowledge that they had enough knowledge and information to know what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, for whom to produce. Even if they had been angels, even if they had only been, you know, sort of ethical eunuchs who cared nothing for themselves and only for the improvement of the conditions of others, how would these people know what to produce? how to produce, where to produce, for whom to produce. The fact is, each individual's knowledge, each individual's information is starkly and significantly limited. Think of all the knowledge in the world and think of how much you personally possess. And I grade some of your exams. I find out how limited your, some of your knowledge is. You know who I'm talking to. But the fact is, is that think about it for a second. Think of all the knowledge in the world. And think about how each and every one of us, you and me, as individuals, how little of that knowledge we possess personally. How can any one of us claim the knowledge, ability, and capacity to direct the activities of multitudes of others, and indeed, the population of an entire society in the context of what our own individual mind, or even the most knowledgeable group of minds, could really know and master, integrate, appreciate, and comprehend in terms of all of the knowledge in the world. So where does this knowledge reside? I like to use the analogy that if you were to ask, where does all the knowledge in the, in the world exist? You might say a place like 
the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. is one of the largest libraries in the world. You can go there and find literally hundreds, maybe thousands, of miles of books on all of those bookshelves in the Library of Congress in all of the major languages of the world, on every conceivable subject ever written about in the world, over centuries, right? Old books, more recent books, new books. So you could say that all of the knowledge in the world resides in the Library of Congress. But it is also the fact that while we can say that, all of that knowledge of the world does not reside in any one book on all those miles and miles of bookshelves. A little bit of the knowledge on this subject at this time of history is in that book, and a little bit in that book, and another in another book, and another book, and another book. In other words, all of that written knowledge of the world is divided among all of the different books. As multitudes of minds representing the authors of those books have understood that knowledge at the moment that they wrote that specific book on that particular topic, focusing on this specific aspect of a small part of the knowledge existing in the world at the time that they put pen to paper or fingers to the keyboard. Well then, more broadly, where does all the knowledge of the world reside? It resides in a little bit each and every one of you. Part of the knowledge of the world is in your mind. Part of the knowledge of the world is in your mind. Part of the knowledge of the world is in your mind. Part of the knowledge of the world is, well, okay, even you. And though my wife is always a little doubtful, a little bit of the knowledge even exists in my mind. That is the arrogance, the hubris, the presumption that Smith was arguing that never is giving such power of regulation, control, and planning so dangerous as in the hands of someone who believes he knows enough to guide and direct the lives and activities of others. Adam Smith used another analogy. It's a famous one, not in his book, The Wealth of Nations, but in an earlier book of his called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He refers to the, what he calls the man of system. Now that's just the social engineer. It's the political and economic planner. And he says the man of system views society as a great chessboard. And on this great chessboard of society, he wants to position all the chess pieces into the order, pattern, relationships that he considers good, desirable, and aesthetically attractive. And he has no patience for anyone who attempts to interfere with or object or argue against his ordering of all the pieces on the great just board of society. But what Smith said is that what this man of system, this social engineer, forgets is that each of those pieces on that great chess board of society, all the chess pieces, are individual real human beings who have their own purposes, goals, motor of initiative, which is their mind and their intentions and desires. And individuals don't want to be positioned on the great chessboard of society by the overarching hand of the social engineer. They want to position themselves to decide what box on the chessboard of society will they choose to occupy at a particular moment in time. What associative connections, relationships, they wish to and desire to form with others who are positioning themselves on other, of others, uh, other boxes on that great chessboard of society. And so the patterns, the relationships, the interactive associations that take form on the great chessboard of society are the ones that spontaneously emerge out of the free and voluntary and choosing interactions of the members of the society themselves, positioning, moving, associating, coordinating and forming patterns themselves. As opposed to the artificial pattern and order that the man of system attempts to impose upon everyone. And as Smith says, that when the, when the, when the pattern that the man of system, that social engineer wants to give to the people on the great chessboard of society is different than the 
patterns and associations individuals wish to form themselves, it invariably leads to social tension and conflict and disruption rather than harmony. And that is what socialism and nationalism of, the, of national socialist Nazi form produced in the 20th century. Not order, not pattern, not harmony, not peace, not prosperity, but tyranny. Because what happens when people don't want to conform to the hand of that great man of system on the chessboard of society? The hand compels it. You will work here. You will live here. This is what you will have as your life purpose. This is the associations and relationships you will have with others that we command, we dictate, we impose. And if you oppose what we are imposing, we have ways to persuade you. It's called arrest. It is called interrogation. It is called torture. It is called slave labor. It is called death. all in the name of trying to order the great chessboard of society according to a plan that the political social planners want to impose as opposed to allowing people to form their own plans and their own associations on that great chessboard of society. These collectivisms of the 20th century that said individuals were required to sacrifice, give up their lives, to be the pawns to be moved about, as the government hand dictated, bore a great cost. It is estimated, for example, that in the old Soviet Union, from the time of the communist revolution of 1917 until the 1980s, shortly before the Soviet Union ended, that as many as 64 to 68 million people may have been killed in the name of building the socialist utopia. 64 to 68 million people. Tortured to death, simply shot, worked to death, starved to death. Innocent men, women, and children who for one re reason or another were viewed as enemies of the people, enemies of the state, not conforming to the needs of the collective plan. In China, under the communists, from 1949, when Mao Zedong led the communists to victory on the Chinese mainland, until Mao's death in 1976, it has been estimated by Chinese and Western historians, those archives are still closed, so it has to be an estimate, right? The communists technically still rule in China. They don't release the dark secrets of their brutal archival materials, but it's still estimated by Chinese and Western historians who are specialized on Chinese, modern Chinese history, that it's possible that as many as 80 million, 80, 80 million Chinese were killed in that period from 1949 to 1976, again, in the name of building this socialist new man, a new socialist utopia in China. Innocent men, women, and children. And the Nazis who ruled in Germany under Hitler from 1933 until their defeat and destruction in the Second World War in 1945, it's estimated that they killed maybe up to 20 to 25 million people. And again, this is not battle deaths, right? German soldiers versus American or British or Soviets. This is innocent, unarmed men, women, children. The six million Jews, the three million Poles, the half a million Gypsies, the quarter of a million Germans, who for one reason or another were considered enemies of the race. And over 10 million Russians, who were the unarmed civilians, men, women, and children, killed by the Nazis in their occupation of part of European Soviet Union during the war years. Death, destruction, mass murder, all in the name of making ordinary people conform to the imposed plan on the great chessboard of society under the dictatorial hand of the political planner and social engineer. Now we're fortunate. We're fortunate in the sense that all of those evil systems have now come to an end, more or less. Well, there's still a few places where you have these extreme forms. North Korea. I'm sure you've followed, seen some of these. North, it's, it's like, it's like, a, 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 like, like a case study in nightmare society. 
I have a friend. He's a uh, well-known uh, newspaper columnist, a free market guy. His name is Doug Bandow. He's associated also with the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. And he's made two or three trips to North Korea. And he said it, it, it's, it's like living in a, visiting a nightmare society. You go into the capital of North Korea, Pyongyang, and you know, all these government-built buildings, you know, according to some you know, plan of you know, the, you know, the gr a capital for the great socialist future, broad boulevards, no cars, hardly any people. And the people who walk, walk sort of like passively, face forward in robot fashion because they've been told that if they interact with any visiting Westerner, they could easily be accused of being a subversive, anti-loyal enemy of the state with the resulting consequences. It's like, he said it was like visiting some type of nightmare robot society, which also is an economic failure. They constantly suffer from, from failed crops, starvation, economic hardship. And then they took Cuba under the Castros. Right? Fidel Castro, probably read a year and a half ago, Castro came down with some illness, had to sort of form, informally and now formally step down. His, his brother, Raul Castro, is in charge of, of Cuba. And they, they too have attempted to retain this communist model of government control of land, government direction of industry, oppressing all individual choices concerning civil liberties and any sort of illegal underground market activities. But even that's changing. Raul Castro has now said that the government is too big, inefficient, and top-heavy, and he's, he's instructed that half a million people employed in government industries in Cuba must plan to lose their jobs and find work in what he's now going to permit as a limited private market sector. Half a million employees let go in communist Cuba. I wish our government would follow that path. Let go half a million of U.S. government employees and say, get a job productively in the private sector. Maybe we should elect Raul Castro as president of the United States. We'd be moving towards more free enterprise, I guess. Boy, is that an irony and a paradox. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> anyway. And in China, they still technically have a communist government. But they have been moved, while they still maintain political control and terrible censorship and, and crushing of any dis dissent, they have allowed limited uh, uh, private enterprise in agriculture and small and medium-sized industry. And even that little teeny opening to human profit motive and self-interested entrepreneurship has resulted in the end of poverty and famine in China. Literally, Tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people, right? China has a population of 1.3 billion people. Hundreds of millions of people since Mao's death in 1976. For the first time in Chinese history, right? Thousands of years have been now been freed from the fear and the hardship and the reality of famine and starvation with just a little degree of private initiative in limited markets. So does that mean that the market economy has won, that free enterprise has won? Well, when the Cold War ended in the 1990s with the end of the Soviet Union, it is this year, 20 years since the end of the Soviet Union uh, at the end of 1991, formerly the Soviet Union as a political entity on the map of the world uh, disappeared on Christmas Eve, that is December 24th, 1991, it was believed that now, you know, freedom has triumphed. Democracy has proven its superiority over dictatorship and tyranny. Free enterprise has proven its superiority over government socialist planning and control. And there was a lot of patting ourselves on the back. But 20 years later, what we see is that while the totalitarian forms of government are gone, such as the Soviet Union or in the Second World War, Nazi Germany, or the passing away of these other communist systems, like in China, at least partly. The fact is, is that we still have this third system that is neither a true free market nor that old-fashioned socialist planning model. What we have in the United States and in Europe and around the world 
is an attempted third system, which we can call sort of the interventionist welfare state. Here, the government does not control and plan and regulate everything down to the most minute detail. But what the government does do is attempt to intrude, interfere with, and regulate and control various and sundry aspects of the private sector market. Now, it doesn't always seem that way. Well, don't I go to the supermarket and buy the foods I want? Don't, don't I go to the shopping mall and purchase whatever clothes and electronic devices or shoes or anything else that I want? Don't I go to the restaurant and, you know, pick the restaurant I want to go to and whatever items I want off the menu? Uh, don't I decide, you know, what university or college I'm going to go to and what career I'm going to pursue? Hey, I'm a free person. Alas, the appearance of freedom is not always its reality. The clothes that you're wearing, the food that you eat or drink, The, um, the, 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 the physical elements of just this hotel. There is nothing in this room. There is nothing that you're wearing. There is nothing that you have eaten or will eat. There is nothing in any facet of your life virtually that does not pass through the sieve of government regulation, control, standards, requirements, or prohibitions. In other words, beneath the surface of apparent freedom is a heavy hand of intrusive and minute detail of government regulation. How to make products, with what materials, with what type of technologies, under what work conditions, with what safety devices, with what meeting of certain standards or benchmarks or requirements. There's virtually nothing that goes on without the intrusive hand of government regulation and control. You notice it in your own corner of the market. If you're a businessman in some little niche or corner of that division of labor in the society, making product X as composed to product Y or Z, in your corner of the market, in product X market, you have to meet various government regulations, controls, requirements, restrictions, commands to buy, to produce your product, to purchase raw materials, to undertake the manufacturing uh, process, to pay for certain regulatory approvals and licensing requirements. And if you're in industry Y, uh, 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 y or Z, you have the, the, your own respective spider's web of such regulations, controls, restrictions, licensing requirements, etc., that envelop and surround you like a spider's web. But you only notice it in your corner of the market where it, it specifically intrudes upon you. And as consumers, we don't seem to si sense it because we just buy the product that comes to the market after passing through this spider's web of government regulations and controls. But it is no less the fact that the government commands virtually everything that is produced in the society. It is a greater degree of appearance of freedom than actually exists. There's also the fact that the government undertakes a huge amount of redistribution of wealth. It can be literal welfare that we think of t taxing individuals X to transfer income to individuals Y, such as a welfare payment or an unemployment insurance check or a social security check or, 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 the, or the medical care check or a subsidy so to some industry or enterprise, either to farmers or or, 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 or to, to, to a manufacturing sector. All of this involves a huge siphoning off of the wealth of the people of the United States. For example, if you could go back into a time machine a hundred years ago, let's say to around 1910, 1911, what you would find is that all levels of government in the United States, local, state, and federal, combined, took only 5% of your income. I'm not saying just one level of government. All of them combined took about 5% of your income. That meant that 95 cents out of every dollar you earned remained in your pocket. You know what the average American now pays? In taxes, either directly or indirectly, combining federal, state, and local 
tax imp impositions, at a minimum, somewhere around 50 or more percent of the average American taxes. Certainly if you include the gasoline tax when you fill up the, the pump, at the pump in the gasoline station, if you include your property tax, if you include your income tax, your Social Security tax, your Medicare and Medicaid tax, and a whole variety of other indirect taxes, the average American, directly or indirectly, pays somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 or more percent of their income to the government, compared to 5 percent 100 years ago. All of this represents the power of keeping the income you've earned in your hands and now having it taken away and given to the government to spend it for you or to allocate it in different ways that they dictate. Now what is the justification for these taxing levels and these spending patterns? Well, it's for government to do things for us, right? It's for government to do things for us. They will assure us retirement. They will assure us medical care. They will assure us a, a housing. They will assure us education. They will assure us uh, this, that, and the other. What all, all these other, they will assure a reasonable level of income for farmers. They'll give a reasonable subsidy for some industry. They, okay, on and on and on. But we need to remember something very crucial. And that crucial element is the following. Whenever the government says that it's going to do things for us, it implies as an inescapable flip side that it has the police power to do things to us. If government is going to do things for us, it must have the police power to do things to us. What do I mean by to us? If the government is going to provide retirement pensions, our social security system, then it's the government that has to decide how much they're going to impose upon you as your payment out of your paycheck towards your Social Security. They are going to decide when you can retire and re receive full disbursement of your Social Security benefit. They will decide how much that benefit will be. They will decide how much of it, after you've died, can then go to your spouse. They're going to decide on age eligibility. In other words, for the government to do it for you, they must have the power to command what to do these things to you. When you will retire, how much you're going to pay in, what your payout will be, and who will be eligible to receive any further such ret pension, retirement pension after you've pass passed away. If the government is going to tax you and then provide health care in the form of Medicare, Medicaid, now this plan that was passed last year and will be fully implemented in 2014, Obama's national health care plan, mandatory health care coverage. Well, if the government is going to give you health care of this wider comprehensive form, or even the existing form, they must also have the power to dictate to you what your health care will be. They decide what treatments you're eligible for. They can decide what doctors you can visit. They will decide what treatments, tests, second opinions you may get. Because they pay, and therefore they decide what you will be eligible for in terms of the co costs they're going to be shelling out as the government disperser of the funds. They will decide what, 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 what pharmaceuticals you may receive. They're going to decide how long treatment and pharmaceuticals will be available to you before they decide that actuarially, since it's the whole society and the taxpayers in general, when it should be cut back or cut off and it's time for you to die. Because it's not worth it from the society's point of view since we're all paying for it through taxes. You can't escape that. You want the government to provide people with housing? Well, then the government has to decide where the housing will be. The government has to decide what type of apartment structures will be constructed. They're going to decide what the facilities, amenities, qualities of the buildings in the apartments themselves will be like. 
and they'll decide who will be eligible and under what terms they can be in such a government established public housing project and how and under what criteria standards and basis that person can continue to be eligible before they're thrown out if the government is going to do this for you they must be able to do that to you you want government to subsidize all or a part of your education well, guess what? You think that comes without strings? It's the taxpayers, the people's money. Well, we can't just waste the people's money. How do we know that it's a reasonable spending of the government money? And therefore, the government, little by little, step by step, increment by increment, has to then say, well, since we're spending the people's money, we have to determine the reasonableness, the fairness, the socially acceptable quality of the curriculum its content, the circumstances of who can teach, what their qualifications are to be, who's eligible, who will get a government grant, scholarship, or loan, and who will not. If the government is going to do that for you, they must have the police power to do those things to you. There's no escape from this. And that gets us back to the point where we started. Which has precedence, the individual or the group? The person or the collective? The individual human being or the state? Where shall freedom and autonomy and self-governance lie? How can you be self-ruling? How can you be self-governing? when the government determines what your retirement will be, what your health care will be, what your education will be, what your housing will be, what your, when your work conditions will be, what you can work at, how you can work at it, who will be allowed to work at it. Then you are not a free person. You are a slave. You are a puppet in the hands of the government planners, regulators, controllers, and directors who decide how you may work, how you may live, what your opportunities will be, and what the eligibility for any of them shall be. And it's all politicized. It's all politicized. On what basis do they make these decisions? There's an entire field of economics called public choice theory. And what is this element? It's a subfield. It's just asking, well, let's think about the logic of economic decision-making and apply it to the political arena. Apply it to the political arena. Oh, there's a social problem, a market failure. Let's have the government solve it. How does the government know how to solve it? On what basis does it even decide there's a problem or how it should be solved? Well, what the public choice theorist asked is that, let's look in the black box of government and say, well, who makes decisions? And how do they make the decisions on what they'll do for us? Which, of course, as I said, means to do things to us. And the public choice theorists pointed out that who are the people in the political arena? And there are three. Politicians, special interest groups, and bureaucrats. What do politicians want? Duh. They want to be elected and re-elected. And why do they want to be elected and re-elected? Because they want political power. And why do they want political power? Well, they might honestly and sincerely believe that they want to do good as their thinking good is, which of course can be a very great deal for what you think is good. But they may be motivated by this, but let us be frank. Some want to be elected because they just like power. They want to be a play, player inside the political ring. They want their place in history. They're power lusters. Now, how does a politician, whatever his motive, to do good for others or just power lusting, how does he get elected? Well, he gets elected through acquiring campaign contributions and votes on election day. Well, how does he get people to give campaign, campaign contributions and to give their votes on election day? And the bottom line is, he sells other people's money. That's what politicians sell. Elect me and I will give you health care. Elect me and I'll give you retirement. 
Elect me and I'll give you a subsidy. Elect me and I'll give you this regulation that protects you from competition at home or abroad. Elect me and I'll distribute, redistribute Joe's wealth to Sam there. And by the way, you're Sam, so give me your vote, Sam. That's what he's selling, other people's money. Elect me and I'll give you other people's money. I'll give you other people's money in the form of a subsidy. I'll tax them to give to you. Elect me and I'll transfer money to you or, the, or groups that you support who, who are viewed as needy or underprivileged or poor from those who I define as too rich or too wealthy or having more than enough. And I'll define what more than enough is. That's what they're selling, other people's money. Who wants other people's money? Special interest groups. Groups who want income that they cannot earn in the marketplace. Income they cannot earn because maybe their skills or abilities are such that the market values them lower in terms of the income they earn than the income they would like to have. So they appeal to the politician that they will vote for him if they, if they give Sam's money to them. Or it could be the businessman who has a difficult time facing domestic or foreign competition. And he wants your money as the consumer, but he can't earn it on the open, free, competitive market. So he wants the government to set up a regulation or a trade tariff barrier to keep the foreign competitor out or make it more costly for the domestic rival so they can't underprice him and capture some of your consumer business so that you therefore buy from him when you otherwise wouldn't in a more freer and competitive market and therefore he gets more money that from you than he would have gotten if the government had not intervened with the regulations, controls and trade barriers. Other people's money. That is what these special interest groups want. They want parts of your wealth that they cannot honestly earn by supplying the better and the less expensive and the improved product compared to what their rivals are offering and which they want the government to intervene then to keep the rivals limited or out. So they get more money from you than you would choose to spend on their products if the market wasn't limited under these government controls and regulations. And the third one is the bureaucracies. Now what do bureaucrats want? Well, just like everyone else they want, they would like to have higher incomes and chances for promotion, which improves one's status. People have the psychology of like to, liking to have higher statuses in their occupation or profession and higher incomes. And how do you have a higher status th through promotion and therefore maybe a higher income? Bigger budgets and larger bureaucracies in terms of staffing who have greater authority to justify needing more, more staff and therefore more opportunities for advancement with higher status and greater pay. And therefore, those in the bureaucracies are always lobbying in their own way at budget time before the congressional committees. Mr. Senator, Mr. Congressman, guess what? We've not solved the social problem for which you've set up our bureau agency or department. We need more money. We need greater staffing. We need great more authority. Have you ever heard any head of a government bureau agency or department going before a Senate or House subcommittee during budget time and saying, Mr. Senator, Mr. Congressman, I want to assure you that the, pro pro the problem, the social problem for which you set up my bureau agency and, or department has been solved. It's we no longer have the social problem. You, you set us up, you gave us the authority, no problem, it's over. Please cut our budget by 50% and let's start reducing staff because we don't need them anymore. We solved the problem for which you established us. And by the way, start off firing me. Have you ever heard of any government head of any bureau agency and department going before Congress and saying that? No. If anything, the opposite. And that's the reality of this. So while not as dictatorial, as threatening, as intimidating, as all-powerful as that total collectivism of old communist Soviet Union, for example, or Hitler's Nazi Germany, you know, the knock on the door from the Gestapo at night, gulp gasp. 
it is nonetheless that it is maybe apparently a milder and less intimidating, but no less enveloping form of an encroaching and expanding government. That's the dilemma we face in our society today. These government interventions, these welfare redistributions, these entitlement programs that have promised things for people when you get old and when your child, children get old, have reached points where they are financially unsustainable. I was just reading an article yesterday uh, by uh, a friend of mine who is a uh, columnist. His name is Bruce Bartlett. Uh, he used to work for the Joint uh, com Congressional Committee, Economic Congressional Committee. And uh, he was doing an analysis of uh, the latest report of the uh, entitlement program, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, the, 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 there, there is the, 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 the Social Security and the Medicare trusts. And there is a commission that is responsible for overseeing the Social Security trust and the Medicare trust. And they issue an annual report under law as to, well, what is happening with Social Security and Medicare? How much money is coming in? How much money flows out to beneficiaries each year for either the medical services of Medicare or retirees under Social Security? And what are we projecting over a 75-year horizon? That's the actuarial horizon over which uh, these, these two uh, trusts uh, look to the future. So basically for the rest of the 21st century, uh, which, by the way, is your life and your children's life. Is that not true? I mean, this is your century. You know, I was born long ago in the 20th century. <coughs> you know, I could kill over and die any second. This is your century, not mine, right? You, you, maybe you might even see the end of the century with if med medical condition, uh, uh, technology improves, but certainly your children will see the end of the 21st century, right? You aren't thinking about kids now, but eventually, you know, guys, you're going to get caught in the net of marriage, and you know what that leads to, little people. And so, you know, if, it, you, know, if, if you don't sit, li live until the end of the century, your kids will. I mean, this is your century. Just as your parents are concerned about you, will you not be concerned about your own kids' futures? Of course. And what are these, what are these, uh, the, 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 these two trusts, Medicare and, Me and Social Security, estimating for the rest of this century? Well, they made estimates currently of what are the unfunded liabilities of the two trusts. Now, what does unfunded liability mean? It means given existing law, who will be eligible looking for retired people as you know, the century goes on and medical care under Medicare given eligibility and services that, that, that are uh, funded under the Medicare rules and regulations. What is the amount of money that therefore is promised looking over the next 75 years that the U.S. government is committed now under these laws to, 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 to pay out to you and your children and grandchildren? It's currently estimated that these two trusts, Medicare and Social Security, owe, looking to the next 75 years, you know, demographics of population, aging, medical treatment, okay? in the neighborhood of close to $65 trillion. This is not billion, I use the T word, $65 trillion approximately. Okay. The entire gross domestic product, that is the market value of all output produced in the U.S. economy during a year, is currently about 14 to $15 trillion. Okay. So this is more than four times the size of just the U.S. output in one year. Where is this money going to come from? Now, admittedly, this isn't paying out in one year. Over, well, Bruce Bartlett in this article, in which he was summarizing the, the trust funds report, reports, uh, said that the best estimate that could be made that if the U.S. government was to be taking in enough taxes to be able to fund all of these promised eligibilities under current law for both Social Security and Medicare, taxes would have to go up now and forever, 60% more than what each and every one of us is paying today. So if you or your family, your parents, you know, filled out your tax form just last month, you know, April 15th, and whatever either you or your parents filled out uh, on your 1040 form, right? 
here's how much I paid in federal tax in the year 2010. Take that amount and add 60% of that amount. That's how much you would have to be taxed now and forever to just meet the unfunded liabilities that have been promised under Social Security and Medicare for the rest of your life and your children's life. And as your income goes up, right, you're going to graduate, you have a, you know, entry-level job, but hopefully your income will go up, right? As, you know, promotions, more job improvement opportunities, whatever that income level is, it's going to require 60% more than that for the rest of your life. That is the burden. We've reached a point of unsustainability. We are at a crossroads. Now, does this mean the system is collapsing, imploding today? No. But the fact is, it's sort of like someone who's just on a credit card binge. They keep borrowing and borrowing, getting more and more in debt. They apply to the credit card company. C -c Can you raise my limit an extra thousand dollars, an extra fifteen hundred dollars? Look, I'm meeting all my interest payments. Uh, I meet my monthly minimum payments. Yeah. You know, so another fifteen hundred dollars, an extra thousand dollars here. And so you know, you keep putting, but a point, a point is reached where you can't put any more on the credit cards, right? And it reaches the point where you put so much on the credit cards that just the minimum payment on a part of the principal and the interest each month is eating up more and more of the income you're earning out of your monthly pay. Well, this is what's happening to the United States government. We already, when, when Bush came into the presidency in 2001, the United States government had already accumulated a national debt from running budget deficits in previous decades of $5 trillion. When Bush left office in 2008, that had doubled to over $10 trillion. And now, just two and a half years into Obama's administration, we bumped up into this, quote, limit of $14.3 trillion. Now, I recently testified, as Dr. Nash mentioned, actually just about a week ago, a week and a half ago, uh, in Washington, before uh, the House Subcommittee on Monetary Policy, uh, specifically on monetary policy and uh, the, 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 the uh, funding of the national debt, you know, whether the debt ceiling should be limited. To be, uh, it's a separate thing. If anyone wants to ask during the Q&A, I'll be glad to talk about it. I basically proposed, uh, you know, one person's testimony before the committee that, uh, no, the debt limit should not be increased. That government should start operating within the tax revenues it currently takes in and should not borrow anymore. But the fact is, reality is, is that between now and August, when in spite of the uh, shenanigans that the Secretary of the Treasury is playing uh, and therefore spending money and borrowing money up beyond the official congressionally approved debt limit, but which will actually reach a threshold which even he can't play smoke and mirrors games with after uh, about the middle of August, uh, they're going to have to decide whether to raise the debt limit, that is how much can government accumulate as debt beyond $14.3 trillion, and they probably will, knowing politics, raise it. But the point is, it may be, you may be, and may be able to put it off for another two years, another three years, another four years. But the fact is, it will reach a point, like what we're seeing in those, what they call periphery countries in Europe, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, possibly now Spain. And that is, the creditors will no longer raise your credit card limit. The creditors will no longer lend you money. And even to just keep rolling over the old debt when you don't, cannot pay the principal off, right? Just roll over the debt as a new loan. The creditors start asking higher and higher interest on your borrowing because they're afraid that you've reached the point where you may not in the future be able to pay back everything you've borrowed. But you know, your old business majors, right, default risk premium on the rate of interest, right? The risk factor 
that the lent borrower might not pay back or not on a timely basis. So to compensate for that uncertainty, you bump up the rate of interest as a risk premium, right? Default risk premium. The United States, in spite of the low interest rates today, may not be able to avoid that themselves in their own way, looking two, three, four, five years down the road. Even if they raise the debt limit and they keep spending money that they don't have. And there's no way around that. We've reached the point of the financial and fiscal crisis of the interventionist and welfare state. It's the interventionist and welfare state's failure that now has to be remedied. And there's a crossroads. Are we going to go down the road of further financial and government intrusive di disaster? Or are we going to now change course and move in a direction of government spending less? government redistributing less, government providing less, government regulating less, government leaving people alone to make their own choices, decisions, and judgments, and to find private sector alternatives. I know that Dr. Nash, uh, later today, will be addressing such issues as private alternatives to Social Security, private alternatives to Medicare. It is the, my view is that I take sort of the original founding father's view, which admittedly is a very minority view. I don't think the government should be involved in that at all. Why should there be government telling you how to plan your health care or your Social Security? There was a time before the 1930s where government has no role in this. I know it's a shocking thought, but people used to plan their own retirement and take care of their own medical expenses. What an idea. And that's the world I think we should go back to. Uh, I'm not expecting, unfortunately, that to be the alternative chosen any time in the immediate future. But there can be private sector alternatives to mitigate, to diminish, to reverse and move away from the degree to which government controls, dominates, taxes, regulates, and intrudes into these matters that have become financially unsustainable. In other words, we have to backtrack and move down some other private sector alternative to get government out of these things because we are heading down a path that in its own historical way will lead us to some type of a future that we already see in these little countries in Europe. Because eventually the money will no longer be lent, the interest rates will climb, and we're going to face a crisis worse than if we try to start correcting it now. But to even admit this problem and to start looking for a solution, we have to start from the following premise we have gone down the wrong path. That this government paternalism, this political collectivism, this notion of dependency of us as citizens upon the government was a wrong direction. And to return to and start moving down a path upon which the country was founded. And that is that philosophy of individualism. It is not enough to be self-ruling and self-governing in the political sense. I vote, I elect the officials. They somehow are supposed to represent views that I have in deciding government policy. It is important for us to restore, renew, and once again believe in and want to practice the other form of self-government and self-rule. That you are a free and independent individual who takes responsibility for these actions and needs and requirements in your own life. To be willing to have the same confidence in yourself that the freed slave in the Old South could only dream of if his master would undertake the act of manumission and give him his freedom. When freedom meant also giving up the master's provision of food, shelter, clothing, and medical care. And that now this meant that to be a free person, I take responsibility for the, these things for myself and my family upon myself. And that's what freedom means. At Northwood University, that's what we view as part of our educational mission. We advertise ourselves, and rightly so, and I like to think in an extremely professional and, 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 and outstanding way as a business school. 
preparing yourselves for careers in the private sector of enterprise, business, and entrepreneurship. But part of that is the institution's fundamental belief on the importance and the profound essentialness that if such a system of enterprise and business and entrepreneurship is to prevail and prosper, it can only do so in a social and political and economic institutional environment in which people appreciate value and are willing to take the responsibility of personal freedom and individual liberty, without which neither enterprise, business, entrepreneurship, nor its resulting prosperity will be possible in the long run. Can we return to such a system? Yes. Nothing is written in the sky. Trends change. Ideas change. People's views and values change. And what seems like inevitable or inescapable when looked through the eyes of the historian looking back at other ages and other centuries is, sound to, to, are, is often seen to be merely the prelude to a change in the direction of people and the societies in which they live. But if we are to have such a change, you must both understand and value and be willing to have the benefits and shoulder the responsibilities of freedom. If you will, we will be free. Thank you very much. Okay, I have left about a half hour for any questions, comments, banana peels, rotten tomatoes. No questions, no comments, no thoughts, reflections, ruminations. We got one right up here front. I think you, um, you oftentimes hear the far left criticize individualism or capitalism as being something that's selfish or cruel. And I was just wondering what your response would be in defense of the morality behind individualism. Uh, I, I, I happen to think that the most humane, moral, and ethical system is a system of individual freedom. I think that it is immoral and arrogant to believe that others uh, should take upon themselves the, the, presumption of, the, the presumed power to tell other people how to live and what is right and just. I'll even go further. I think that a society in which the government tries to, quote, do good works becomes maybe even possibly an immoral society, but personally, but certainly an amoral society. Let me give an example of what I mean. Our society is one that even with the regulations and controls and taxing that I was talking about, is one of a society of great prosperity and individual choice. And one aspect of this is that even in our society in which individuals have the freedom to, to a great extent still live their own life as they choose, and earn the income and spend the income that they have acquired, uh, there is a huge amount of private charity and benevolence in the U.S. Uh, every year, Americans, even with our tax burden, give literally tens, indeed hundreds of billions of dollars in private charity and philanthropy to a wide variety of, of causes. Uh, and that's because while government does a lot of these things, it's still viewed culturally, psychologically, that it is the responsibility of the individual to show a sense of a part of the responsibility and burden of uh, assisting in these activities with their fellow individuals when there may be situations or circumstances where people have fallen upon hard times not of their own making or illnesses that require medical research, etc. In fact, there, the, the, the average American family contributes hundreds of hours of their non-work free time in in-kind charitable work. Now let's compare that with Germany. 
I'm just using Germany as an example because I, re I read an article about something like this. Uh, l last year, or about a year or so ago, a number of wealthy Americans, including Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and others, got together and made a, a, a pact amongst themselves. And that pact was is that uh, out of their huge individual accumulated billions of wealth, uh, while of course all of them would want to, when they passed away, want to leave money so their own families would be comfortable, they had a pact that they would leave a good fraction of their accumulated private wealth for various charities and, and philanthropic causes. Okay? Now one can say one thinks that these are good or better philanthropic and charitable causes or less deserving causes. It's their money and they made this pact that they're going to give their private wealth that they've earned in the marketplace to voluntary good causes as they're defining good causes. Okay? Uh, I believe it was either in December or January of this year I was reading an article in the German weekly news magazine, Der Spiegel, uh, that they did a survey of a segment of uh, the, 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 uh, the German business community, uh, a segment of uh, the extremely wealthy and successful uh, German industrial CEOs. And they asked these German businessmen, sort of the European equivalents of maybe not quite in terms of wealth, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, but multimillionaires. Uh, would you be willing also uh, to uh, join a sort of a, a, a pact with other such successful German businessmen to leave a good portion of your wealth uh, to private charity? And uh, they interviewed, after doing the survey, several of the businessmen in the survey. And virtually all to a man, these in, in, uh, economically successful, uh, entrepreneurially uh, astute, uh, wise, knowledgeable uh, 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 German businessmen, they all virtually said, no, it's not my job. It's the job of the government to tax my wealth and then give it to needy causes because they have the expertise I don't. Well, l let's think about this for a second. Th these are not stupid businessmen. They run multi uh, 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 multinational corporations often. They handle, you know, uh, 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 workforces of, of thousands of people. They manage several divisions and know how to evaluate the, the worthiness, the profitability, the efficiency, the effectiveness of, of a wide variety of enterprise activities that are under their management and control. And these obviously are people who are clearly would be quick learners and perceptive analyzers of what's good, better, or worse, okay? But they're basically saying, it's not my job. Why is it not their job? Because they are the victims and the product of the same social psychology as the vast majority of other Euro Europeans, I would say, tragically and unfortunately. And that is the paternalistic me mentality. Well, that's what the government's for. Uh, it's not my job to be concerned with charity. It's my, not my job to be concerned with philanthropy. My job is just to earn money and then have the government tax me 50%, 60%, 70%, as is often the case in these European countries, again, when you include the entire full tax package. <clears throat> and it's government responsibility to take care of this. It's the welfare mentality that makes people desensitized, indifferent, and callous towards any sense of personal social responsibility. And I'm meaning this in the most positive and generous and benevolent sense. You know, you're part of a community. You, you, you know some of your neighbors or people in your society. There are good causes. And without compulsion, without you know, I I irrational senses of guilt, you just may feel that it's, as a member of a society, it's worth helping in these various good causes. And that's part of the American culture, the American psyche still. These Europeans have had it drained out of them. And without meaning to be uh, sort of a, you know, a comical caricature, it's as if this German is saying, I only obey orders, I paid my taxes, and I just do what the government tells me. I mean, it is the government's duty and responsibility to take care of the people, not me as an individual. I mean, hello, you know, I'm sure I can walk. 
And I uh, saw, so, if you ever seen the movie Dr. Strangelove. Anyway, and again, I'm, I don't mean to pick on Germans, because the same attitude, I'm sure that if you did a similar survey of French, Italian, Swedish, Dutch businessmen, would be absolutely and positively no different. Because that is the embeddedness of the welfare state mentality among the entire population, including the leaders of the business communities over there. Now, how is that moral? You know what a moral act is? A moral act is when you're standing at a, a, a crossroads, you know, in your mind, and you could do A or you could do B. And A represents doing something good, and B represents doing something bad. A moral act is when you choose to go down path A, the good act, when you could have chosen to do B, the bad act, or the indifferent act. That's an act of moral choice. Morality comes from the ability to say no, not being forced to say yes. I consider, therefore, a welfare state society as a society that undermines the psychology and the social sense of personal responsibility, of not only earning income, and not only being able to make your own values, choices, and decisions to live for yourself, but to have to ask yourself, well, what does it mean to live for myself? What are my values? What do I consider important? And not just in that narrow sense of buying a house, furnishing it, going on a vacation, but also a sense of sharing certain common values, beliefs, and senses of reasonable, benevolent uh, duty with other members of the community to assist others who may have fallen upon hard or tragic times not of their own making. In Europe, that's been destroyed. And I believe that has made people, these German businessmen, I'm just using them as an example because they were the ones surveyed, again, European, Europeans in general. It hasn't made them immoral. It's made them amoral. Not part of, you know, my responsibility. And therefore, I consider that our free capitalist system both provides the opportunity and creates a sense of personal obligation to choose and decide to act in these non-market ethical ways compared to the welfare state far more embedded in Europe that it's destroyed it. So I believe that they create the at least amoral and possibly even immoral society and our free society has the potential to create the far more ethical and moral human being. L let me make one other thing uh, on this point. Um, th there was a book by a Frenchman. It came out long, long ago. But it's, you know, an oldie can sometimes be a goodie. It's called The Ethics of Redistribution. Uh, Bertrand de Juvenel. And uh, he, he talks about another, a number of aspects of, of government redistribution of wealth. But, but he, he says is that what government does when it redistributes wealth is not just take from Peter to give to Paul. It takes out of Peter's hands the ability to act in a charitable and benevolent way. Because the government then siphons off that wealth, and the government then decides who's worthy and deserving, rather than that obligation being on the individual soldier, shoulders. But de Juvenel goes on and makes an additional point. And that is, is that in a free and healthy and open society where these senses of obligation, duty, and responsibility reside with the individual, it is that mechanism through which the next generation is taught what's important. You know, when you were a little, very little kid, you learned how to walk and talk by copying your parents, right? You learned from them. They, in that sense, molded you part of what you are, besides the genes. Well, when a child is growing up and they see what good causes parents support, what charitable work they do, uh, how they have a sense that besides other f uses of their money, doing this charitable or philanthropic work is, 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 is considered right and proper. The child, through a process of osmosis, learns that as well. When the state siphons off the wealth to such a degree that little is left for an individual to take on that personal and moral sense of possible obligation, you lose the means to pass on that sense of charity and philanthropy to the next generation because the government has taken away the money through which you could have done it and demonstrated it to your children to have that same healthy sense as well, if you follow what I'm saying. 
And that's why I consider our free society generates good behavior in these areas, as well as the right of the individual to make those choices freely and as he defines them in his own mind. Dr. Everling, you were talking about um, Medicare, Medicare earlier, and you're saying it's all going to go bankrupt. Now, the biggest issue in, in the program going bankrupt is the, the pricing of the actual Medicare. Just assuming that we were to go to an option of buying private care for individuals, the pricing and the quality would still be an issue. Mm -hmm. Now, this comes from the fact that there's a third party involved in the transaction. Right. Now these insurance companies, financiers, how do you get rid of them? How do you make a transaction between an individual that needs help and a doctor? Uh, well, I would argue that uh, there, there needs to be a transition, uh, the details of which would have to be worked out, because obviously you can't do this overnight, uh, to not only get the government out of this, uh, but to, but to, to generate a, a a tax incentive system in which uh, employers actually do less of this and that the responsibility of finding, paying for, and taking an interest in the, the quality as well as the costs of health care falls more and more upon the individual and the, and the, and the, and the family. Why do I say this? Uh, how do you get your home insurance? Does your employer pay for your home insurance if you own a home? No. Uh, does your employer pay your auto insurance? No. Uh, while uh, uh, life insurance may be partly supplied through an employee uh, employment package. Uh, usually people have insur life insurance policies uh, chosen on their own. Uh, and I believe that in that situation individuals make wiser and more astute and reasonable decisions. That doesn't mean we have perfect knowledge and we don't make mistakes and sometimes, you know, don't think about things as much as hypothetically in some objective sense we could. But the burden falls upon the individual. Uh, it's my money directly. Who am I going to take out auto insurance from? Who's offering me the best deal for this coverage? Uh, who will offer me the best service? Uh, I won't name the insurance company, but I have auto insurance, obviously. And I had a fender bender, okay? Right? A car backed into me as I was pulling out of a place in a shopping par area parking lot and they uh, smashed into my uh, bumper and, and side panel. Uh, and the, the car is right now at, at, a, at a, rip, uh, a dealership uh, body part uh, repair place being worked on. Uh, not, not, as soon as I reported this, within 20 minutes, the claims adjuster was calling me on the phone. The claims adjuster told me to go to the body shop repair place of my choice and get an estimate. I went there the next day. Okay? I had the estimate. They printed it out. They then faxed it to the claims adjuster. And 10 minutes later, the claims adjuster called me back after getting the fax and said, approved. Have them do the work and the check will be in the mail which was in the mail and in my hands within five business days, though mailed from a different part of the country. Okay, and the work is being done. And they're paying for a loaner from a, rent, for, from a, from a, a car rental company while the car is in the shop because, you know, two-car family, right? Well, okay, that's what I drove down here in. Now, why are they interested in, in efficiency? And, 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 and expeditiousness, that is, doing it as quickly and as insurance policy holder friendly as possible. Because I can pick a different auto insurance company. And, you know, the policy, you know, is, is technically renewed on a six-month basis. They just sent me a thing in the mail, you know, because if you're good driving, your deductible has been reduced to X from X plus three. And, uh, you know, because of this, that, and the other, we're cutting your premium, uh, you, know, you know, good driver. Why are they doing this? Because I can pick a different auto insurance company, and there's plenty of them. Now, why would we not expect that the same motives and incentives would work for medical insurance if 
both the government and third parties were removed. And you earn your income, and now you have to decide what medical care you want and what coverage you need, given your age, your family, the riskiness of your profession, your just nervousness in being either risk averse or not risk averse. What's the problem? And you, since it's out of your, out of your take home pay, what do I want to pay in premiums? And for what medical care? With what, with catastrophic, not catastrophic, deductible? And I would make my own choices. And the insurance companies would be com competing directly and immediately the same way the auto insurance companies are. So, they would, so you have a medical problem? No problem. Just fax us what the doctor says. We'll look it over. We'll have our medical treatment adjuster check it. Fine. No problem. Service with a smile. You have to set the market to work. And if you do so, you'll have more competition, better quality, greater efficiency, and over time through the competitive process, lower price with better medical care. And that's the alternative we have to move into. I do not claim, I'm not an expert on medical health insurance economics. And so I cannot say this is step one, step two. But it is clear at, in, conceptually, the logic is that we need to move to these private sector alternatives if we want to ha have cost control, incentives for quality and efficiency improvement, both on the part of the insurance carriers as well as the medical services that the insurance companies are paying for. <clears throat> Questions, comments? Everything is clear? I have a feeling they want a break before lunch. I have that, yeah, I know you, you're students. I see that in class, oh, the, you know, constantly looking at the clock. I know who you are, I know who you are. Anyway, thank you very much. <clears throat>